So what I'm going to cover next is floating point representations. Right? In order to sort of motivate the idea of floating point, let's just take a quick motivating example, right? Uh, spice circuit simulation. The typical range of the values that you would find when you are trying to represent an analog circuit, right? I mean, you might end up with something like voltages, which could be up to five volts maximum. Like, uh, possibly maybe only 1.8 volts or 1.2 volts depending on what kind of range of values that you're looking at with the resolution of the voltage in the millivolts range possibly because you might want to have some accurately specified reference voltages and so on currents normally bias currents would be in the range of you know milliamps or tens to hundreds of microamps leakage currents could be in the range of nanoamps and the impedances themselves would typically be in the range of kilo ohms to mega ohms. Right? These are just typical numbers that you are likely to find in a spice simulation for, uh, let's say, some circuit that you are designing. Now, if you look at the dynamic ranges out there, what did I say? 5 volts with the resolution in the millivolts range. So, this is approximately a dynamic range of few thousands. Right? Nanoamps to milliamps is a bit more. This might be up to 10 power 6 or so. Okay. Versus impedances, this is again roughly 10 power 3, right? What I mean by that is, I'm interested in values from the kilo ohms to the mega ohms range. The dynamic range that I'm looking at is roughly 10 power 3 or so. But if I look at the raw numbers that need to be represented, right? And I don't do the scaling by talking about nanoamps versus milliamps versus mega ohms and so on. In the worst case, I could end up with nanoamps, that is 10 power 9 amps, versus 10 power 6 ohms, right? I could end up with 10 power 15 as the dynamic range of values that, that is the largest versus smallest raw numbers that I need to represent. And if I decide that I'm going to have an integer representation or a binary representation that directly can handle these, that essentially corresponds to 45 bits. Okay, roughly you can say that three bits corresponds to one decimal digit, right? Because two power three is about eight, which is close to ten. So every three bits or so corresponds to one decimal digit. This so ten power fifteen corresponds roughly to forty-five bits, right? If I did not have that and I actually use scaling factors separately, then my actual dynamic range is only going to be determined by this one. This has 10 power 6. So I need around 20 bits. Okay. So the question becomes, how can I represent all of these different numbers in some consistent manner without having to go on, you know, uh, worrying about what scaling factor is being used and what number I'm representing. So we are looking for a more efficient use of the bits. Right. And in scientific notation, right, that has problem has already been solved. What we say is if I had all of these different numbers to be represented, I could have them all represented in a similar manner with the scaling factors taken care of separately. I have to sort of specify the scaling factors independent of the significant digits, right, or the significant, so to say, right. So I can basically break up the representation in other words into a significant digit or significant bit and an exponent portion. And there are you know a few different options that we have over here. One of them is something where each block of computation has its own exponent. The other one where which basically corresponds to what I've shown over here is where each number has its own exponent. Okay. So this portion where each block has its own exponent, I'm going to skip over that for now. I'm not going to really get into that detail, right? I'll just skip this. It is something that is interesting and is used in a certain, in, in some specific cases, but is not very common. Okay, I'll skip over it for now. And come to the representation where each number carries its own scaling factor along with it. Okay. So, the mantis are, in other words, as we have already seen, is the important part. This actually tells us what the numerical value is. And the scaling factor, in fixed point, this was implicit, right? That is to say, I had a convention which said that I am using either like a, a 
four integer uh, bits or two integer bits and you know i have to i have to keep track of it here what i'm saying is the number itself will keep track of its scaling factor for me. okay and in this case what we do for this floating point representation is we just use a separate sign bit okay an example of floating point representation in this way is what is called the ieee 754 standard right this is called ieee 754 single precision floating point number right it essentially corresponds to 32 bits right which is divided as one bit for the sign eight bits for an exponent and the remaining 23 bits for the mantissa okay what that means is i can effectively now represent numbers using a mantissa value like this right i could basically supposing i had a value of 0 1 some values over here this would essentially correspond to i will sort of implicitly put one one over here right and make this 1.01011110 1, 0, 1, 1, etc into 2 power this exponent okay so where did this implicit one come from remember what i did over here in this representation i wrote all of the numbers such that the digit before the decimal point is not zero right that's the only thing that i really need to take care of i, I make sure that there's only one digit and that that digit is not zero okay this is what is called normalized scientific notation right so i'm using exactly the same concept over here right i do normalized scientific notation in order to do binary so what have i done i have ensured that there is only one digit to the left of the decimal point the binary point and that that digit is not zero in binary that means that digit is one right it those are the only two choices which means do i really need to represent it no i can drop it and call it implicit okay so that is how i basically got this thing where even though i have 23 bits for the mantissa my actual significant is 24 bits okay what that means is the largest positive value corresponds to one dot put all ones over here right and the ex the largest exponent that i can use right where did this plus 127 come from once again this is also some convention and some slightly non-intuitive use of numbers that was uh, put into the IEEE standard right there is some justification to it but bottom line is it actually is a little bit confusing the largest positive exponent that can be used is the value plus 127 the smallest or most negative exponent is minus 126 okay you will notice that this range is only 253 not 255 which means that there are two exponent values that are missing from this range okay those are sort of special cases they are left out for now but the important point is i now have the largest positive value if i actually evaluate it it comes out to roughly 3.4 into 10 power 38 the smallest value comes out to be 1.2 into 10 power minus 38 which means take the ratio of these dynamic range is approximately 10 power 77 okay compare this with 32 bit integers the largest positive value is 2 power 31 the smallest positive value is 1 the dynamic range is 10 power 9 okay so 10 power 77 versus 10 power 9 you can see that by using exactly the same 32 bits but a different convention for how i interpret the numbers i now have a dynamic range of 10 power 77 instead of 10 power 9 okay this is precisely the problem that flew
tipping point numbers are trying to solve. They are allowing you to have a wide, much wider dynamic range of numbers that can be handled. The problem is there are certain numbers that cannot be represented accurately in floating point. In fact, if you go look at it, right, declare something as a float in C and try assigning it the value 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, the integer, you will find that when you print it out, it actually comes out as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 9, 2. Because that 7, 8, 9, you know, the entire 9 digit integer cannot be accurately represented using 32 bit floating point. Okay, so you are sacrificing some amount of representation, something that could have been represented as a 32 bit integer but you are gaining a much higher dynamic range. There are a couple of special cases as I said, one of them corresponds to an exponent value of equal to 255 and a mantissa value of all zeros. That essentially corresponds to infinity, right? Which means that suddenly we have the ability to actually represent the concept of infinity as a number, right? And similarly, we also have not a number, which is, you know, values like 0 by 0, infinity minus infinity and so on. So in other words, special cases can be handled as part of the regular number representation itself. There is also something else that can be done called denormal numbers, which, you know, once again, I'm just going to skip over this for now. It's not very important for our purposes at the moment. So what I want to quickly now, uh, and, you know, uh, now that we know what was the motivation behind floating point, right? It allows us to carry the exponent along with the number, which means that now we have a self-contained representation that has both the value as well as the exponent, right? And what was the main reason for doing it? Because I could have a much higher dynamic range of values that I could represent, okay? What's the catch? Apart from, of course, the fact that there are some integers that cannot be represented accurately using floating point. Is there anything else that is a problem as far as floating point is concerned? And well, the answer is yes, especially from a hardware point of view. Right? So to understand that, let's look at how you would do something like addition of floating point numbers. Right? So the examples I'm going to give are all going to be with decimal, but you know the same principles hold for binary as well. Right? So the let's look at the problem of adding 1.23 into 10 to the power of 10 with 3.45 into 10 to the power of 4. Okay, so I need to find out the significant part and the exponent part. Okay, so the first thing I will need to do is I need to convert them both to the same exponent so that I can add the significant parts appropriately, right? So I compare the exponents and shift the mantissa values, which means I would write it something like this. Now both have the exponent 10 to the power of 10 and the mantissas can be added together. What happens when I add them? I get this value 1.230, etc., etc. Right? Now, clearly, now the mantissa has a lot of digits, which the original numbers did not have. They had only three significant digits. Right? Obviously, the reason they had only three significant digits was because I have a restriction on the number of digits that are allowed, the amount of space that I am permitting for this representation which means I'll need to convert back into three digits. That is done by rounding. Okay, I need to round back to the original number of digits. In this case, that rounding would basically get rid of that 0, 3, 4, 5 value altogether, right? And interestingly, what you find is that you end up back with 1.23, right? And what is the exponent? Update the exponent, it is 10 power 10, which is the common value between these two. Okay, so you can see that, you know, there is this slightly complicated sequence of steps. I need to compare the exponents, I need to shift the mantissas. The addition part is straightforward. That's the part which is the same as in regular integer or fixed point arithmetic. Then there's a problem of rounding and updating the exponent. Okay. All these are extra steps compared to integer or fixed point. Right? What happens if there is an overflow? Right? So I have two values like this 1.23 and 9.99 both into 10 power 10. Add the mantissas, I end up with 11.22. Right? I can't handle this. So what should I do? 
either I can say, oh, you know, overflow, but that's not really the case because after all, I can handle this range of numbers, right? 11.22 into 10 power 10 can definitely be handled by the numbers that I have. What I need to do is shift the mantissa so that I normalize it, right? Then round back to three digits and update the exponent. It now becomes 10 power 11 instead of 10 power 10. Okay, so once again, straightforward to explain, but it means that from the hardware point of view, it's going to probably, you know, there are a lot of conditions that need to be checked when I'm implementing this. This last example that I'm going to look at is, you know, just is the same uh, principle. It just shows one more complexity that we have to deal with. Let's say that we are you know, trying to subtract two numbers that are very close to each other or add a number with a negative number and the numbers themselves are very close to each other, right? One is 1.23456. Now, of course, I have more digits in my significant to start with, right? And the other is minus 1.23455. What happens when I add them, right? The exponents are already aligned. So just add the mantissas. I get zero point blah, 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 right? I have to normalize this. And for doing that, I need to sort of scan through this significant portion, right? To find out where is the first non-zero value, right? That is called leading one detection, right? And that is an extra circuit piece of circuitry that needs to go into the hardware. Once I have that and I shift it, I can basically rewrite that you know, this 0 0.0001, I can rewrite it as 1.00 into 10 power minus 5. And then I have, you know, once again, the 10 power the final exponent to be taken care of, right, which I need to update with 10 power 10. And finally, the final exponent is 1.00 into 10 power 5, right. So because when I had these two numbers that were close to each other, it's no longer just a question that the exponent changes by one. The exponent could change by a large quantity, right? And I need to be able to do this leading one detection in order to find that. The net result of all of this complexity is, uh, well, uh, is that, you know, something like addition in, uh, yeah, something as simple as addition in floating point is quite complicated to implement in hard, okay? Now, what I described so far was 32-bit floating point representation, but there are many other variants as well. Already in typical computers, you will come across double precision, right, which is 64 bits, which has a dynamic range of 10 to the power of 600, right? Why do we need this? There are actually many scientific computations that require double precision floating point, right? Uh, you can't really get by with uh, single precision in a lot of cases. On the other hand, when you go especially to the domain of problems like neural networks, you find that half precision is sufficient, right? A 10-bit mantissa with a 5-bit exponent is good enough, right? This has a dynamic range of 10 power 9, right? Which doesn't look very great until you realize that with 16 bits, you have got the same dynamic range of 32-bit integers, right? So effectively what it means is if you could have something which could have been represented using 32-bit integers, right, which has a dynamic range of 10 power 9, you could now handle it with 16-bit floating point. There are other variants. There is something called the B-float 16, right, which is something that was used by Intel. Uh, it introduced it sometime last year or so. This once again has the same dynamic range, 10 power 77, as 32-bit floating point. Right? But it uses only 16 bits. The problem is it has much lower precision. That is to say the smallest values that can be resolved are, you know, spaced much further apart. Example, you can't really represent pi even to sort of four decimal digits. Right? Uh, those of you who are interested in this might have come across this announcement from NVIDIA just last week. Right? Uh, where they uh, introduced this concept of something called TensorFlow 32, which again is targeted at neural network type applications. What are they trying to do? They are basically saying that I will use the exponent range of 8 bits corresponding to regular 32-bit floating point and the 
TF32, the, you know, rather the uh, mantissa of 10 bits corresponding to 16 bit floating point and end up with a TF32 representation, right? Which actually needs something like 19 bits for internal representation and computation, right? The point is, even though it needs these 19 bits over here, that is, they are able to save on multiple things. One is the amount of data that needs to be loaded or stored from memory and also on the internal critical paths of the computations. It's not very clear how they get such a huge improvement, but they are claiming up to 6x improvement in terms of training of, uh, you know, uh, large neural networks. Okay. Now, there is one last consideration from the point of view of hardware, right, which uh, this slide over here is actually from uh, uh, a presentation by Mark Horowitz in ISSCC 2014. It corresponds, this data corresponds roughly to, uh, I think, a 45 nanometer technology, but very similar trends will hold even today, right. There are some very interesting results over here. What you can see is that, okay, forget about the 8-bit add, but a 32-bit integer addition can be expected to take roughly 0 0.1 picojoules of energy. Okay, so this is a good way of looking at it. Rather than talking about the power consumption, you can talk about the energy per transaction. Every multi, every addition, every 32-bit addition will consume 0 0.1 picojoules on average. Right, depending of course on the number of bits that flip from 0 to 1, 1 to 0, etc. The num actual number will change, but on average it will be around 0.1 picojoules. On the other hand, a 16-bit floating point addition will be 0 0.4 picojoules, right? Whereas a 32-bit floating point is 0 0.9 picojoules. It's 9x of an integer addition. Okay. Multiplication, on the other hand, is 30x of integer addition. Right? One way of looking at it is that, you know, it sort of makes sense that a 32-bit cross 32-bit multiplication is more or less similar to adding 30, 32 partial products. Right? So you can expect roughly a 30x uh, energy increase. On the other hand, floating point multiplication is not as expensive as we would think. Right? It is more expensive than integer multiplication, but not by too much. Right? It's not like the 9x uh, hit that you consider on floating point addition versus integer addition. On the other hand, you go to the column over here. Right? And this is where you see the real monsters as far as energy consumption nowadays are uh, concerned. Right? Every access from a 1 megabyte cache memory right, takes around 100 picojoules. That's like a thousand times the energy of one integer addition, right? And an access from DRAM is literally several thousand times the energy required for one addition. Which means that for a typical instruction, if you look at the energy breakdown, it turns out that the computation very often ends up being a very small part of the total energy requirement. Okay? And this is something especially nowadays when we are talking about design for low power and so on, is something that you need to keep in mind. More than even the computation, you need to focus on the energy being consumed in the memory accesses and find out how to sort of optimize those in some 